Uh, hi everyone, I'm Corey Bauer. I work here in the Ed School over here with the PhD students. Uh, so, a few years down the road when you want to get yet another degree, come see me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to start by saying that I'm really excited about this competition. Uh, this is something that a lot of faculty have been working for a long time and pushing really hard to get. Um, and I think that this is the start of bigger things, the start of uh, the shift, a shift in the way that we view education, and especially college education, um, and giving students more opportunities to take charge of their education, to get out, to experience the real world, uh, to lead projects, and not to just sit here while I talk at you like we're about to do. Um, and so I think, so to me it's really exciting, and I hope it's really exciting to you too. Um, we still have another week left for registration. I know when I was a college student, I never did anything eight days before it was due. Uh, so, I still don't, so uh, let's be honest here. And uh, so, I already have the number of teams registered that we have is, is really exciting to me. Uh, I'm definitely optimistic about how many registrants we have. Of course, for those of you who have already registered, that means more competition, I guess. But I think the more teams we have, the more, uh, the more we can work together and the, the greater the chance that we'll have two or three or four prizes in the future instead of just one. Uh, so, this today has kind of two different purposes. One is to understand the context of poverty in the United States, look at a little bit of why this is important, why we want to address these things. Two is to think about how that affects your actual proposal, what you want to do, um, what exactly, what problems you're tackling. So the first part in the uh, paper that you're going to write, the, uh, what are we calling it, the uh, concept paper, um, is to actually come up with a statement of the problem and say, here is the problem that I want to address. Um, so what is the problem that you want to address? So hopefully today will help you start to get a handle on that. Uh, next week also, same thing, it's going to be talking about the problems that people are facing in these neighborhoods um, and why it's so difficult to, um, to get uh, people to eat healthily and to get healthy food to the right people at the right time in the right way and so on and so forth. Um, so partly being uh, with my background in education, and partly because it's the easiest for you to relate to since you guys are all in education right now and just finished K-12 education, um, I like to use educational stats as kind of a good proxy for how poverty affects people and how kids are doing in the U.S. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about that. So I think everyone's heard the term achievement gap before. Uh, if you haven't, this is literally what it means, is that we have a graph of it started with uh, talking about white versus the white-black uh, achievement gap. So we have the average score. Uh, this is from the, it's called the, the NAEP test, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, this is the average score for a white kid over the years and the average score for a black kid over the years. And we can see there's literally a gap between those scores. And so that was about uh, 20 years ago now that uh, the first book came out talking about the achievement gap and, and why, it, why it was there and how we could solve this. Um, and so the interesting thing is that ever since we started talking about it, it hasn't, nothing's happened. Um, that in the 70s and 80s, this is the size of the achievement gap, it was cut about in half. That the, the average score of a white kid compared to a black kid was half as high in 1990 as it was in 1970. Um, and now, the last quarter century or so, it's basically flatlined. This is math, um, uh, reading is the same, is the same picture. So if you think that's depressing, it actually gets worse. Which is that if we don't, if we, instead of looking at race, so this is what I just showed you, the racial gap's been declining. This is the income gap or the rich-poor achievement gap. Back in, uh, for kids born in 1950, it was about half as big as the racial achievement gap, and it's doubled over that time. Um, so this is, I don't know how many of you have taken uh, stats classes, but this is standard deviations here, so it's more than a full standard deviation. Um, which is basically very, very large. Um, and it's continued to get worse over the last quarter century that the gap in outcomes in school between the people at the 90th percentile versus the 10th percentile is huge. And the reason for that um, is mostly, I mean, there are a zillion different reasons, but it's mostly not because of what's happening inside of school. And we'll get, we'll get back to that in a couple minutes. All right, so in terms of you in college, who are your peers? Who, who ends up in college? So if we look at what background people came from, what their families were like when they, when they were in high school, 
we find that if we look at the top 160 institutions across the country, fully 75% of students come from families that are in the top income quartile. Only 10% come from families that are in the bottom half of the income quartile. So colleges in general are basically bastions of inequality, that we have lots and lots of kids from upper middle class homes and very, very few kids from working class and low income homes. Um, and it gets worse. Uh, this gap has been growing bigger over the last uh, 30 years. So if we look at, this is some research out of the University of Michigan, and what this shows is these are kids who were born in the 1960s, that 5% of kids from the lowest income, uh, lowest income quartile went to college versus 36 from the top income quartile. So the gap was about 30 percentage points. Uh, these are kids that were born about 1980, the start of the millennial generation, so this one up 4 percentage points, but this one up 20 percentage points. So now the gap is uh, over 40 percentage points. Um, but more than half of kids from the top quartile complete college, but still under 10 percent of kids from the bottom quartile complete college. Uh, so why is this? So one explanation could just be that kids from upper income homes have you know, better study habits or something like that, they're working harder in school. Uh, that's kind of like the, the easiest explanation. So here's another study. This looks at educational attainment. So this is 12 years, meaning you finished high school. This is 15 and a half years, so you basically got through college. And this is the average low SES, uh, middle SES, and high SES. And this is the number of hours of homework uh, completed per week in high school. So if you were a poor kid who did zero hours of homework per week, you went to about half a year of college. If you're a rich kid who did zero hours of homework per week, you went to about two years of college. Um, and here's the most striking thing about this chart to me. Like I said, the rich kids who literally did zero hours of homework per week in high school completed two years of college on average. The poor kids who did 13 hours of homework per week in high school, so they're working two hours every day, completed a year and a half of college on average. So it's not just about effort. Uh, the laziest rich kids are, are going farther in school than the hardest working poor kids. Uh, and this is probably part of the reason why I had to shrink this down to, to fit it in here. Uh, but if we look across a whole bunch of countries and we compare educational attainment of kids to their parents, we see most countries here, these are how many are doing better than their parents, are getting more, more school than their parents. The U.S. is way down here where we have about 30% of kids going farther than their parents, about 60% are going just as far, and about another 10, 15% are actually doing worse than their parents. Uh, and so we, and that's largely because, it's not, it's not because the wealthy kids aren't going to college. The wealthier kids, they're going to college a lot more than they used to. It's the, the working class and low income kids that aren't going to college. Um, so why is that? Why are we seeing this big gap? Why are we seeing the gap grow? So we know it's not just because of effort in school. Uh, the other easy explanation is that it's about school quality, that kids who live in inner city go to schools that are run down, that are out of control, that have burnt out teachers or something like that. And that's probably part of it. Uh, but we know from almost 50 years of research now that it's not what happens inside school that really affects how kids do in school. Uh, it's what happens outside of school, that two-thirds of the variance can be explained by non-school factors. And so the way I like to think about it is this, is that from the time you're born to the time you turn 18, only about, depending on how much you sleep and how many days of school you attend, only about 13 to 15 percent of your time while you're awake is actually inside a school building. So 85 plus percent of your time is outside your school building. You're with your family, you're with your friends, you're at piano practice, you're playing in the yard, you're you're doing homework, whatever it is. Um, and so it's not really about what happens in the school. Not that that's not important, but it's really more about what happens at home, um, in your neighborhood, um, et cetera. Um, and so we have evidence of this because we can tell if we follow the achievement gap over time, the day kids start kindergarten, before they've gone to a single day of school in their entire lives, half that gap is already there, just from the development uh, as preschoolers. Um, and it grows faster during the summer than it does during the school year. So there's more inequality in experiences 
during the summer when kids are all at home than there is during the school year when kids are all in school. That as much as uh, schools with upper income kids are better run than schools with lower income kids, the gap is larger between kids who are at home in poor neighborhoods and kids who are at home in rich neighborhoods. Uh, think about how a lot of upper income kids spend their summers traveling, going to museums, going to summer camp, etc., whereas low income kids can't afford to do any of those things. Um, and so that's a, a large gap in, in lifestyle and experience. Uh, and so if we charted this, we would see there's already a gap at the, at the start of kindergarten. They grow roughly equal paces during the year, but then during the summer, um, there's actually regression in learning that kids will have lower scores on tests in September than they did in, in June, um, low income kids. Um, and so the kind of the traditional way of thinking about this in education policy research is that we know that poverty impacts school quality, we know that school quality impacts academic performance, um, but what we're now finding out is that actually these other three things, that home and health and housing, have a larger impact on academic performance, and these are all highly dependent upon uh, your socioeconomic status. And if you live in poverty, you're going to have worse housing conditions, you're going to have worse health conditions, you're going to have uh, worse home conditions. And those are all going to result in worse performance um, in school. And like I said, anyone, anytime that families are having kids that are doing worse in school, that's correlated with anything else you can imagine. That's kind of a proxy for, well, for all these things, for parenting, for health, but for vocabulary, for pretty much any desirable outcome that you could want a kid to have, non-cognitive skills, sharing, self-control, um, you know, uh, attitude toward all sorts of things, health, nutrition, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so if we're seeing kids that are doing worse in school, we can be pretty darn sure they're also doing worse in terms of food and health and nutrition, which we're going to focus on for this competition. Um, so I did a, a big analysis for my dissertation looking at why it was, what things uh, impacted, and I came up with 19 different things that we all, we had a significant amount of research uh, that they impacted academic outcomes. Um, and so you'll notice that these are all things that are going to impact uh, your topic and what you want to choose. And these are all things people are experiencing because they're living in poverty, and they're all things that are affecting kids' outcomes in life. Um, so vision problems, a lot harder to get to a doctor, to get eyeglasses, to get vision therapy, etc. Um, home environment is affected, higher rates of violence and crime, lower rates of home ownership, higher rates of mobility and homelessness. Um, Worse nutrition, which we're going to talk about, uh, lower rates of physical fitness, physical activity, higher rates of stress, we're going to talk about that, more environmental toxins <coughs> and pollution, uh, that's a big issue in Niagara Falls, uh, worse prenatal care, so while kids are in the womb, what kind of care are their parents being able to um, afford and, and receive, uh, also different parent, parenting styles, different amounts of language exposure, uh, so on and so forth. So these are all things that when you write your concept paper and you're thinking, here is why there's a problem, here is what we need to address, these are all things that you should bear in mind. Um, let me, let's skip past this a little bit. Um, the bottom line here is that, I think you've all seen these on the news, that when we look at growth among classes, that it was pretty even for about 20, 30 years, and now since about 1980, you can see the bottom 80% uh, here have all been fairly steady, but the top 5% has grown a lot, the top 1% has grown a lot, a lot, the top 0.1% has grown even more, and the top 0.01% has, has now eight times more income than they did uh, 30 years ago. And, that's, and this is part of the poverty puzzle, and part of the reason why it's important to, um, to work with people who are down here, which is not just you know, five or ten people who are living in poverty or something, this is the majority of the country have seen very little growth in incomes in the last 30 years. Um, and that's part, and that's affected economic mobility, that we founded this country as an egalitarian society where everyone could climb their way up the social ladder and grab themselves up by the bootstraps and go from being rich to being, or go from being poor to being rich, or I guess the other way around if you really wanted to. Um, but if we look at changes in income, we see that this is by educational attainment. Um, that if you have anything down here, you're actually learning less money 
than uh, you were in 2000. And it's only the people up here with the very tippy top degrees who are making more money on average uh, in 2010 versus 2000. Um, this is another way of, of looking at this here. This might be clear to you. So this is from 1991 to 2000. So 20 or 2010, rather. So 20 years of development, growth in GDP, rise in the stock market, uh, etc. And we can see that people with a bachelor's degree make pretty much exactly what they did 20 years ago. People with less than a bachelor's degree, it's significantly less. So don't drop out of school, finish your bachelor's degree. Uh, and if you want to make a lot more money, uh, then you got it. It's now becoming more and more important that you get postgraduate education. Those are these are the only people that are doing better now than they were in 1990. Anybody know what percentage of adults have a post baccalaureate degree, a master's or a PhD, or a JD or anything like that? Is it like seven percent? Huh? Is it like seven percent? Yeah, it's roughly ten percent. So roughly ten percent of the country fits into these two categories that are doing better than they were 20 years ago. The other 90% are down here. Um, and so this is, and we go back to who is getting these degrees. These aren't the smartest 10%. These aren't the hardest working 10%. These are largely people who came from the wealthiest families that are getting these degrees. And this is why we see this. This is a little bit harder to, to understand, but I have another chart to show you this. So this is where you were born so were you born in the bottom, so quintiles the bottom fifth versus the top fifth, and then the bar on the vertical axis is where you ended up. So 43% of people who were born in the bottom fifth, when they grew up, they were still in the bottom fifth of income, versus less than 5% here of people who were born at the very bottom ended up at the very top. Meanwhile, people who were born at the very top, 40% ended up still at the very top when they grew up. Um, so we can see this is definitely not equal across quintiles here, that the poorer your family was when you were born, the more likely you are to be poor when you grow up. Um, and this is actually worse now than most other developed countries, um, most of Europe and, and places like that actually have higher rates of people moving up from the bottom to the top than the U.S. does, um, which is what Two, three hundred years ago, we were like, England, you know, poor people can't move up. We hate them, we're going to move here. And now England actually has higher rates of social mobility than we do. Um, all right, so a whole lot of numbers. I'll tell you what you should be looking at here. So this is another way of displaying kind of the same thing. People who were born in the bottom quintile and what percentage ended up in the top quintile. Um, and this is also taking into account education. Um, so as much as I said education was the, the be-all and end-all of everything, the blue ones are people who um, graduated from college. So if you were born in the bottom quintile and you, and you still somehow managed to climb out of it and get a college degree, still only 10% ended up in the top quintile and 17% in the next quintile down. Um, whereas people who were born in the top quintile slacked off, didn't get a college degree, 25% of them still ended up in the top quintile. So basically, you're just as likely to be rich if you were born rich and didn't get a college degree as if you were born poor and scrapped your way up to get a college degree. So again, it's not the wealthiest, they're not the most educated, they're not the hardest working, it's largely the people who were born into wealth. Um, and we look at part of why is that, what's happening here. And so there's kind of been an argument about you know, who is actually poor in the U.S., what can you afford if you're poor. And so there's a, a large um, contingency of research out there that people in the, in the U.S., they're not really that poor. They can all afford a microwave or cable TV or uh, you know, things like that. And so we can see that over the last, oh, I forget how many years this is, um, it's the last 10 or 20 years or so, that the cost of consumer electronics has plummeted. Televisions are half as much as they used to be. Clothing, cell phone service, toys, computers, these have all dropped considerably, so a lot more people can afford them. But things that actually affect how well you do in life, college tuition, child care, health care, vehicles, food and beverages, those have all increased in cost. So it's now harder for low-income people to afford these things, even though it's easier for them to have these material goods. 
Uh, so why is this important? Um, so, you know, I'm not normally a big quote person, but if we're going to quote anyone, quote MLK giving a Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Uh, but everyone is interrelated, all men are interdependent. This isn't just about helping other people, it's also about helping society. And that if people in society are failing, it hurts everybody in society. It doesn't just hurt those people. Um, it's not like, you know, if Anna and Dave want to screw up and go be poor, it's not like only they're suffering. That's also impacting our entire economy and our entire well-being. So, I don't want them to fail because I care about them as people, but also because I care about everyone as people and I care about myself as a member of society. Um, this is something that a lot of people have trouble understanding for, for one reason or another. Um, so just a couple of examples. So we have some cost-benefit analyses by some fancy economists. Um, every time someone drops out from high school, it costs our country $127,000 in lost taxes, increased crime, etc. Um, so consider a million or so people are dropping out of high school every year and think about how much better off our country would be, how much lower our debt would be, etc. if we could get these people to graduate from, from, uh, from high school. Um, and then childhood poverty in general, we have an estimate that that costs us $500 billion annually. That's an awful lot of money, um, even when we have a budget in the trillions. Uh, we also have, you know, inequality is controversial and the evidence is less clear, but we do have a number of emerging studies that uh, inequality harms health, that the simple act of living somewhere where you can see that everyone else is better off than you seems to have, there's growing evidence that it actually affects how you feel about yourself and how you take care of yourself and how your body functions. Um, and uh, economic growth as well, that there's a number of more and more economists arguing that when we have greater inequality, we're more likely to go into a recession. Um, and so if we look back, I didn't pull in here, but the two highest points of inequality in the last hundred years have been right before the Great Depression in 1929 and right before the Great Recession started in 2008. Um, so it could just be a coincidence, but there's growing reason to believe that it might not be. So again, some people failing doesn't just hurt them, it hurts everyone in society. Uh, so how does it affect individuals? What happens when you're actually living in poverty, you're out there, you can't scrape together enough money to, to get rent or a car or whatever it is that, that you want to get for this month? Um, so we have more negative life events, all sorts of traumatic things. Uh, we'll get more of that in a second. People, uh, children who grow up in lower income families and neighborhoods are exposed to more violence, more crime, more disorder, measured in all sorts of ways. Um, less residential stability, they move a lot more often, they're less sure of where they're going to live the next month, uh, more homelessness, more mobility, uh, they live amidst more physical deterioration, lower quality housing, more broken windows, more asbestos, more things, more homes and buildings that are falling down and rotting and, and, uh, and deteriorating, they reside in, in noisier areas, more crowded areas, more polluted areas, um, and we actually, so noise, we actually have a bunch of interesting studies on where they've looked at people who live in a particularly noisy area and how that affects their, their outcomes. Um, so we have some interesting studies for people who live right next to airports and they got the planes always flying overhead and they actually develop um, language slower than people who live in quieter areas. Uh, we had a school that was right next to subway tracks and they looked and there was a hallway, and all the rooms are right next to the elevated subway tracks. Kids were performing worse than the kids right on the other side of the hall where it was much quieter. Uh, and we have a, a major study where we had all these high-rise developments right next to these highways, and the kids on the lower floors were doing worse, and they couldn't figure out why, and they kept testing for everything and anything. And then they finally looked at the noise levels, and they're right next to the highway, and they have all this background noise all day long, and the kids at the top floors didn't have all that noise, and they were developing vocabulary faster because they weren't uh, hearing the background noise. Um, and lower-income children experience a lot more family disruption, um, and, and they, arguably most importantly, but like I said, arguably, possess fewer resources, resources with, with which to combat those problems. That if you have unlimited spending ability, you can overcome some of these things, you can imagine. But if you don't, it's going to be harder to overcome these things.
Um, the other big thing that's been coming out the last five years or so is how it impacts stress. And we're going to give a little simulation in a couple minutes here. So there's something called allostatic load, which is the degree to and frequency with uh, which the body's stress management system has to act. So your body is designed for fight or flight. So if there's a stressful event, your body is very adept at panicking, running away, getting a surge of adrenaline, lifting a car off someone who's dying, you know, whatever it is. That's how your house is built, or your uh, body is built, rather. So the analogy that I like is that your house treats stress as though it's a bunch of firefighters. So if a house catches on fire, firefighters are really good. They get there, they, they uh, chop a hole in the roof, they douse it with water, they put the fire out. And that's good. It's a one-time, it's a short-term response. But think about if every day the house caught on fire, every day more firefighters come, they douse it with higher pressure hoses, they chop into it with axes, pretty soon that house is going to be completely destroyed. Because they're not, their goal is not to leave a house standing for 10 years, their goal is to get the fire out in the next 10 minutes or hour or whatever it is. And your body's stress system is the same way. That one stressful event, you can deal with it, you pull yourself together. But when it's constant stress, day after day after day, it eats away at you. Your body gets attacked by your own stress system every day, and pretty soon you start to fall apart. Um, and so we know that higher income families uh, and families with more education have lower allostatic loads. Uh, that they are leading less stressful lives, which is really hard for some people to grasp because you're like, but I have this term paper due, I have this job search to conduct, I have to drive my kids to soccer practice and baseball practice and piano practice, and you know, I have so much stress in my life. But it's a very different type of stress than saying, oh my god, I don't know if I can pay my rent this month, I don't know if I can afford to go to the doctor, I don't know if I can afford to feed my family tomorrow. That's a much more pervasive, a much more toxic kind of stress than the day-to-day -day stresses about which most of us work. Um, and we also have uh, backwards looking data that adults who spent more time in poverty as kids now have uh, higher allostatic loads as adults. So it's not just it affects you today, that carries over 5, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, 